Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference, hosted by MRI Online. We created Noon Conference when the pandemic hit as a way to connect the global radiology community through free live educational conferences that are accessible for all. It's become an amazing weekly opportunity to learn alongside radiologists from around the world. And we encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous Noon conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership to get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Learn more at MRIOnline.com. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Majid Khan for a lecture on vertebral augmentation, past, present, and future. Dr. Khan completed his radiology residence, residency at NUMC Stony Brook University and his subspecialty training in neuroradiology at Johns Hopkins University. He is at present on the neuroradiology and interventional radiology staff at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Khan is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in spine tumor ablation and spine cement augmentation procedures. He's published extensively on these areas and has been invited to lecture, preside over panels, run workshops, and moderate sessions at many national and international conferences. At the end of the lecture, join Dr. Khan in a Q&A session where he will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Khan, please take it from here. Thank you, Ashley, for your kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the country. So let's get started about uh, vertebral augmentation, where we were and where we are and where we are hopefully going to be in future. These are my disclosures. So today what I'm going to talk about is mostly going to be relevant with in regards to benign compression fractures. We do vertebral augmentation for pathological fractures, for traumatic fractures, but overwhelmingly what I'm going to talk today will be with in relation with uh, the uh, benign fractures. And we know osteoporosis is perhaps the most important cause of uh, vertebral fractures. So normal bone, as you can see, this is the healthy bone with sinusoidal cavities and the trabecular pattern. Osteoporosis literally means porous bones or bone that is full of holes. And when you look at the picture, you can see that the sinusoidal cavities have enlarged and the trabecular pattern has significantly thinned out, giving the typical appearance to the bone that we are used to seeing. Uh, this is another uh, microscopic uh, picture of the trabecular cavities in normal bone and compared to the osteoporotic bone. You can see in the picture below how, how enlarged the sinusoidal cavities within the trabecular bones are. And if you look at the cortical bone also, that also shows similar loss of the osseous uh, material. And, and you can see porous looking uh, cortical margins of the bone. Overall, 700 1,000 vertebral compression fractures happen in the U.S. 70,000 of these patients with vertebral compression fractures will end up getting hospitalized with an average length of stay for about eight days. So you can imagine uh, just a fracture. We normally don't think about vertebral fractures leading to such extensive length of stay in the hospitals, uh, but it happens. Now we know, previously we used to think that it is a diagnosis of females only, but now we know that 25% of the males will also sustain osteoporosis and can develop uh, uh, compression fractures due to osteoporosis. So looking at the silver tsunami that once osteoporosis was called and still is, if you look at the numbers back in 2010, Americans age 50 and more made up about 54%, 99% of the population back in, in 2010. 
and more than half of that population had osteoporosis and osteopenia, which total was about 17% of the entire population. But now we have, will be increasing this number by about 27% uh, up to about 2030, and it will go even higher. So this is a big elephant that is, that is sitting in the room for us. If you are a numbers person and really want to know the dollar amount that is being spent on this diagnosis, uh, this is a very alarming slide, uh, at least to me, that I saw that the total amount of money that is spent on patients with osteoporosis, that's, that's total care of osteoporosis, hospitalization, inpatient, outpatient care, you can see it's about 4.8. Eight uh, billion dollars compared it to myocardial infarctions and stroke, uh, so it's much higher uh, than even typically what we think about are the biggest money guzzlers when it comes to patient care and inpatient and uh, uh, spending a dollar amount on these on specific diagnoses. This is one of my patients. I just wanted to show you the sequence of events that happened in this patient's life. So 51 year old female back in 2009 had a low uh, DEXA score. So had a mild osteopenia. Nothing was done for this patient. In 2016, she sustained an L1 an L2 fracture, she had an upper respiratory tract infection, had a bout of coughing and fractured her bones. She was 58 then, nothing was really done to address her problem at that point also. 2018, she develops two more fractures, a T10 and a T11 fracture. And you had to be cognizant of the fact that each fracture is a sentinel event uh, in this diagnosis and, and can be definitely prevented if specific care is given to the patient at specific points. And then, and then finally in 2019, when I saw her, she had another fracture of T12 vertebra. So multiple compression fractures, which really could have been avoided had she had proper care, diagnostics tests would have been done, no recent DEXTA comparing the numbers to her previous DEXA scan, and nothing was really done to reduce her fracture risks. So we, we really, sh all of us get old, but we shouldn't be really getting like older, older, and osteoporosis and fractures definitely make us old. This is literally the comments that I have heard in my clinic from patients that I have seen over the years. Uh, most importantly, especially with female, you, you hear this a lot that I'm, I'm losing height. Uh, talking to elderly patients either who live alone or as a couple and losing the ability to drive to do all these different chores that they are used to do has, will have a devastating effect on their life uh, because they are, they're doing everything by, by themselves without getting any help from anywhere. Uh, I have heard this many, many, many times in this day and age, osteoporosis should be known to every person, especially people over 50 years of age. But I tell you, this is, this is something that's, that's consistently heard from our patients day in and day out that I have no idea about osteoporosis. Nobody told me to be on calcium or other uh, treatment modalities. And if I had known it earlier, this everything would not have happened uh, to me. It's very, very consistent uh, symptom that I hear from these patients. Okay, imaging of osteoporosis. We know we get plain radiographs. We, we have these ghost vertebras. I, I literally tell my patients that I can see through your vertebras. They are so thinned out. And this is just an example of that. It's not much difference looking at soft tissues uh, compared to these osseous bones uh, in this patient. Healthy bone on a CT should look like this. It should be quite dense. And this is the appearance of osteoporosis on CT uh, with a compression fracture. This, so this is your typical ghost vertebra. You can see some 
uh, increased fatty content of the vertebral bodies, thickened trabeculae also at times, and loss of trabecular pattern in some parts of the vertebral bodies. So we, we, we can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis on CT, but it's not consistent. D differentiating normal bone from osteopenia slash osteoporosis is, is, can be done reliably most of the times, but differentiating osteopenia from osteoporosis can be hard on grayscale CT imaging. So back in 2019, we came up with this uh, colored enhanced detection where we did a retrospective study by putting this uh, CED on abdominal CTs that are done routinely and to see if we can compare it to the patient's DEXA scan and what results uh, we get. And, and, and it, it, it had really good results and we were able to put colors on the bone on CT and able to make uh, a diagnosis of osteopenia, osteoporosis, or normal bone within two seconds. And so these are the grayscale imaging, and this is the color uh, detection images that have been put with red being osteoporosis and green being uh, uh, normal bone. Uh, we followed it up actually with a prospective study validating uh, uh, the colored enhanced detection. And again, it had very, very good correlation with uh, DEXA scan. MRI, in, especially for an interventionalist uh, who is treating these osteoporotic compression fractures, can be very, very useful. If you have your own clinic, you're, you're looking at your patient, uh, examining the patient, Really, we do not need an MRI if I have point tenderness at a particular location. My x-ray is showing a compression fracture and my patient is also telling me that the pain is maximum at this location. We don't, but unfortunately, some of the insurance companies really will want you to get an MRI before you intervene on a patient's fracture. So most of the practices will have some cross-sectional imaging either CT or preferably MRI uh, that you will have to get. And, and really MRI helps you to age a fracture. If you see in edema, you know it's a, it's a subacute or a chronic, uh, I mean, a acute fracture and helps you differentiate in a patient with multi-level fractures, a chronic fracture from more acute fractures, but really you're not treating an MRI. It's many, many times I have had patients who had just subtle changes on a stir image on an MRI uh, right next to a vertebra that had big time edema in the, in, in the body. And the patient, when I saw the patient in the clinic, they were complaining of more localized pain in that subacute fracture rather than in the acute fracture. So, so you, you're really treating the patient and not always the MRI. MRI helps, of course, I'm not saying that you should not get it, but it's, it's very helpful, but more helpful is when you examine the patient and when you know what the patient is telling you. So we do get a lot of lots and lots of MRI in these patients. So we came up with this vertebral uh, bone quality score, which is the VBQ score based on MRI. And we compared this uh, to DEXA scan and, and, and wanted to see how this VBQ score will be able to predict the fragility fractures uh, independent of the bone mineral density. We, we actually published few papers based on the VBQ scores. Uh, it was actually one of the outstanding papers that was in NAS in 2020. Uh, and it showed really good correlation with the DEXA scan in predicting patients with osteopenia and osteoporosis. So basically, we just did a signal intensity from L1 to L4. We divided it by signal intensity of the CSF and came up with the VBQ score. Uh, and as I said, it, it really helped us because we get MRI right, left, and center in most pa patients. So this is something that can be very easily, quickly done uh, in patients, and you will come up with a score if the patient doesn't have a DEXA scan and all that. So now we have a patient who has an established fracture. We have imaged the patient, whatever imaging you have obtained on that patient. And now we have to take care of the patient. Uh, so there are multiple 
services that are involved in treatment of these patients, right from primary care, you have the medicine guys, you have the nursing staff, the physical therapists, uh, they usually come up uh, from the ED, orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeons, and then we have the interventional radiologists also getting involved in the treatment of such patients. So in intervention radiology, we treat the vertebral compression fractures by doing vertebral augmentation. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the research that has been done in this realm, uh, because most of the people will come up with some controversial papers that came out in 2009 in NEJM uh, journal, which is probably the biggest impact factor journal. Uh, and it had a huge implication on the practice of doing uh, vertebral augmentation. Uh, two trials actually came out, uh, Bushbinder from, uh, published in 2009 and Invest uh, trial in also 2009 uh, pub were published saying that vertebroplasty, specifically vertebroplasty compared to a sham procedure. And they said that vertebroplasty had no benefit uh, over a sham procedure. Looking at this graph, you know, the, the numbers of vertebroplasty or augmentation that was done before the 2009 paper, uh, there was a humongous dip, about 35% dip uh, in the number of procedures that were done post-2009 up to almost 2012, 2014. Uh, uh, when the numbers started to pick back uh, up again. So what's the literature since those two landmark trials that, that got published uh, in the NEJM? Just to give you an idea, about 4,000 articles have been published on vertebroplasty and about 2,000 on kyphoplasty. Uh, two mega meta-analysis meta have been done of 2,500 patients included 52 level one and level two articles. Uh, there were actually certain things that were found in, in the Bush binder study that came out in 2009. And it has been downgraded now from a level one to a level two based on certain flaws uh, in, the, in the setup uh, of, those, uh, of those trials. Uh, this is uh, the few few examples of few papers that came out, and this this the conclusion here is really alarming that about thirty five percent reduction in mortality risk at up to four years for patient undergoing kyphoplasty when compared on when compared on uh, emergent basis, and Zampini also found the same exact almost forty eight percent lower risk in patients so. Uh, big implication papers uh, like this. Uh, the conclusion of some of the papers was that the, because of the decrease in the number of augmentations that were done, it in turn, the five-year period following 2009 was associated with elevated mortality in patients with vertebral compression fractures slash osteoporosis. Uh, so the mortality actually went up post those 2009 papers. So these were the two papers that were published in 2009, comparing vertebroplasty with sham. These are the three papers that were published later on using the same sham procedures, and all three of them uh, proved that vertebroplasty had better results, pain palliation, uh, compared to a sham procedure. And just this was a free trial that was statistically significant in almost all the parameters that were used uh, in, in 2019. Uh, these are very high impact papers. Just I just wanted you guys to take a look. Look at the number of uh, patients that were involved from the Medicare data. Uh, 2 million, 1 million, and almost all of them showed that uh, uh, doing augmentation was better than non-surgical management on, of these patients. So much has been done since 2009. I know some of some of the some of the our our surgical colleagues still are referencing those 2009 papers. But uh, those of you who want to set up spine practice, 
should really read up on these new papers that have come out, which are clearly showing a benefit uh, of uh, doing augmentation over uh, non-surgical management. And this is a landmark paper from uh, my good friend, uh, Joshua Hirsch uh, from uh, Mass General uh, that came out, which, which really showed that you need to do 15 vertebral augmentation procedures to save one life and about 12 uh, procedures to save one life at five years and compared it to almost 22 management patients non-surgically to save one life and 24, so almost double uh, in the non-surgical arm compared to the augmentation arm. Uh, this was this is a really landmark paper that that because no other paper really shows the mortality benefit, uh, long term mortality benefit of these procedures, and this this paper clearly showed that there is significant mortality benefit by doing these uh, these augmentations. Okay, so now we 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 get the patient in our clinic and we start to discuss uh, with our patients. Uh, about vertebral augmentation. So, so what do I tell my patient when they first come up in my clinic about when I have assessed them, what am I, what am I offering to my patient? So we are either doing vertebral plasty, we are either doing balloon kyphoplasty, or we can do an implant kyphoplasty for such patients. And the patient always tend to ask, hey, what's the difference? Why am I, why are you telling me that I'll get kypho over vertebro or an implant over balloon kyphoplasty? Uh, so we all know that when you inject cement directly into the vertebral body, whether you're doing it through one pedicle or you're doing it from both pedicles, it is vertebroplasty. If you put a balloon in, create a cavity, and then put the cement in a pre-created cavity, it is a balloon kyphoplasty. And then the implant is where you put a titanium implant in the vertebral body, and then you inflate that implant in the body uh, to restore the fracture height. That's the implant kyphoplasty. Personally, uh, I, if the vertebra has just lost minimal height, I will do vertebral plasty. If it's a mild to moderate fracture, uh, I may do balloon kyphoplasty versus an implant kyphoplasty. But if it's a moderate to severe fracture and I can fit an implant in that vertebra, I will do an implant kyphoplasty because you want to raise the height of the vertebral body also. Uh, but having said that, the main aim of doing this is pain palliation. So almost all of these have shown to decrease uh, your your pain by at least four to five, if not more, points on a visual analog pain scale. So going back uh, into the percutaneous spinal procedures, uh, in 1934, actually, Ball, Ernest uh, Ball was the first person who started to do image-guided procedures. So pretty much this is exactly what we do to this day. He, he actually, if you look at these diagram, uh, he is coming infrapedicular and coming along the inferior aspect of that neural foramen just to avoid the nerve. And what we do now, we mostly we try to come transpedicular, but this was back in 1934. Uh, and pretty much the technique is still the same, exactly the same uh, uh, what he did back then. Next, uh, we came up with what to put in the vertebral body or in the osseous structures. And that was because what happened in the ac acrylic acid was used back in 1843. Then in 1877, we had a German uh, chemist look at the polymerization of the methyl methacrylate to polymethyl methacrylate and the solidification of that. And that's what was used later on in plastic sheet, in plexiglass uh, that we don't normally now see in our cars and some of our musical instruments uh, in, our, in our, we used to see that in our planes also the plexiglass that was used. Uh, in the World War II, uh, because of all the injuries that happened, to, especially the craniofacial injuries that happened to uh, patients uh, with deformities and all that, actually cranioplasty with these acrylic plates were, were used 
uh, for these uh, facial deformities uh, back then. Uh, people have also used PMMA casts for corpectomy. These days now we see these big fancy uh, corpectomy cages once you do a vertebrectomy. Uh, but back then, they used to put uh, a, a cast of uh, PMMA in the in, a, in the vertebrectomy side, and it was used for those uh, surgical maneuvers also. Uh, so the first vertebroplasty, if you look at the history, was actually done done in France in 1984. Uh, Galibert and Deramon were the two guys who performed this. This was actually a guy who had aggressive. Uh, C2 uh, hemangioma, and the surgeons did not want to operate on the patient. Uh, the patient was having excruciating pain, uh, so that's when they thought of doing this percutaneously. They went in through the transoral route, uh, and these are these are actually the, the original images. You can see the needle coming in through the transoral route into the C2 vertebra, and then they have filled it with PMMA, and the patient had dramatic relief uh, after they injected about three cc's of uh, cement into the uh, C2 vertebra. Uh, they did seven cases uh, of aggressive hemangiomas after that with uh, percutaneous vertebroplasty. Uh, these, these are just uh, some notes uh, from their original paper, and it was, it was really fascinating to read them that they had said that radiotherapy is the usual treatment uh, uh, for, for such patients, but it couldn't be done because it was close to the spinal cord. And now these days with SBRT and all the other things, we take everything for granted. Uh, but this was, this was in their original paper how they, how they came up with this. So vertebroplasty coming to US uh, was actually in 1993. Uh, a paper was presented at ASNR by the Dermon group from France. Uh, and then three of these, our greats, uh, John Mathis, Lee Jensen, they actually went to France and they learned vertebroplasty from the Dermon group. And then they came back to University of Virginia in 1993 and started doing vertebroplasty and uh, reported uh, a case series was reported in 1997 actually uh, about uh, uh, vertebroplasty. Uh, they used to make the cement on their own. Uh, so you can imagine these days, again, we take it so much for granted. We have really good cement, thick, viscous cement. And back then they had to mix everything right on the table. Uh, people who do this a lot day in and day out can, can, can uh, realize how much of a pain it would have been uh, back then. But so, and we owe a lot to these guys of what we're doing today. All the fancy things was because of what they did back then. And, and uh, they were, they all, came up with this idea of adding barium uh, to the cement so that the cement can actually be seen uh, uh, very nicely as the cement goes into the vertebral body. Okay, so now going talking a little bit about the indications of doing uh, the vertebroplasty. So if you have a painful osteoporotic or a traumatic fracture, which is refractory to medical therapy, uh, it is indicated. If you have a pathological fracture, be it from metastasis from any solid tumor, multiple myeloma, we, we do uh, cement augmentation. Hemang vertebral hemangiomas, more so uh, aggressive hemangiomas, we do it. If the patient has Cumell's phenomenon, osteonecrosis, this is a really good procedure to do. And sometimes patients with chronic fractures who have ongoing compression, uh, and have uh, a painful back, we, we tend to do this uh, procedure. Uh, traumatic fractures were, are, are, are done more so by our European colleagues, but now SpineJack has gotten FDA approval uh, in the US also, because most of the insurance companies would not cover uh, vertebral augmentation and traumatic fractures in U.S., but hopefully that will change now with with um, uh, uh, the implant kyphoplasty. 
So this is just a few examples of a bipedicular approach, vertebroplasty. As I said, that when you do a vertebroplasty, you just get the needles in and start putting the cement in straight away in that compressed bone. And so this is an example of a bipedicular, two needles have gone in and that cement going in into that compressed vertebra. Uh, so it, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's done very commonly, very routinely. One of the things about a vertebroplasty is that because you have not created a cavity, so if there is good bit of impedance in the bone, the pressure inside the bone uh, is very high, you may not be able to get a whole lot of cement into that vertebra. Uh, so, so you have to keep that in mind uh, also. This is a unipedicular axis. Now, many instruments have come from many companies which will let you get in from only one pedicle and then you have a curved needle that you can cross over to the contralateral side and start putting uh, cement in the vertebral body. And here you can see we have vertebra plana almost here and we're coming in, we just threaded this curved needle right across that plana and then we started putting cement starting at the contralateral side and then we keep on pulling our curved needle back so that you spread the contrast completely from one pedicle to the ipsilateral pedicle uh, filling up the vertebra. Uh, this is uh, something that these curved needles really help you with is that I put the curved needle in, I crossed the midline here, then I went, I can, I can curve it up, I can curve it down. So here I started putting cement by curving the needle up. So I put the cement underneath the superior end plate, which is the end plate that is fractured probably nine out of 10 times. And then I curved it down and put cement along the inferior aspect also and completely filling up the uh, vertebra with cement. Uh, with the unipedicular axis, uh, if you're doing multiple level, contiguous levels, I usually do three or at the most four levels in one setting. Uh, you can see very nicely that uh, you can alternate the entry of the needles into the vertical bodies. If you were doing bipedicular, this would not have been possible because the needles touch each other and you would not be able to put four needles uh, perhaps at the same time if the fractures are moderate to severe and very close to each other. So that's another distinct advantage that you get by doing a unipedicular excess. Uh, bipedicular kyphoplasty, very similar to the excess is the same, just like you do the vertebroplasty, but here now you put a balloon in the vertebra, you inflate the balloon, create a cavity in the vertebra, deflate the balloon, and then you put the cement in that pre-created cavity. So the advantage that kyphoplasty gives you is that you can put more cement, more cement goes into the vertebra under less pressure, so the chances of cement extravasation are less theoretically compared to a vertebroplasty at times. Uh, so here you can see the, the balloons are going in. Here I have inflated the balloons. The balloon touched the midline. This is called the kissing balloon technique. Uh, that's typically how it should be. Uh, and then you deflate the balloon and then you put the cement in crossing the midline. You have to cross the midline. You cannot put cement only on one side of the vertebra because uh, that probably did more disservice to the patient than helping the patient if you have cement only on one side. Uh, similarly now, companies have come up with this unipedicular kyphoplasty. So it's, it's very useful because if you can get away with doing uh, anything from one pedicle, why do you want to puncture the patient twice. So, so it's, it's, it's been, it decreases the table time, it decreases the radiation to the patient, to the operator, uh, table time is decreased. And uh, it's, 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 these days a lot depends on the table time. So it's, it's definitely helpful. And, and the results are pretty much the same uh, com uh, comparing a unipedicular to a bipedicular kyphoplasty. Uh, so here uh, you can see that I've come in now. Uh, this is the balloon that has crossed the midline. Again, you have to make sure that your cement and balloon go into the midline. So that's very important because you don't want to be on the ipsilateral or the contralateral half of the vertebra. You have to be in the midline. So that's what we have done. This is how it looks on the lateral view. 
Uh, this is uh, the balloon should be in the anterior middle third of the vertebra. That's another important thing because you don't want your cement coming into the posterior column because posterior column doesn't uh, take any part in the axial uh, dissipation of uh, force. Uh, and here we have inflated the balloon right in the middle of the vertebra. We are in the anterior third of the vertebral body on the lateral, and then we start deflated the balloon and started putting cement in uh, as, as we did in that uh, unipedicular kyphoplasty. If for some reason you want to do this uh, with CT guidance, you can absolutely do that. This is one of my patients who had frozen shoulders. So we tried to do it under fluoroscopy, but her arms were, she could not lift her arms up. Uh, so we had to do her in CT. Uh, and you can see that this is, this was actually a pathologic fracture. You can see this lytic lesion involving the vertebra. Here we are coming in, we have put the balloon right across there. Here the balloon is getting inflated, cement going in, cement going in. And this is the post picture on the same patient with the cement uh, well and truly in, in place within the vertical body without any evidence of extra. Okay, so the first generation when we started all this, of course, medical management uh, and, and vertebral plastic. Then the second generation is when we, when Kaifon came up with this uh, uh, balloons and we started to think about balloon kyphoplasty. But all along we were thinking that how can we raise the height of a fractured vertebra? That was the thought process. And, and those of us who have been doing this for many, many years, we have, we have used many, many devices uh, over, over the years just with this thought of we need to restore the height of the vertebra rather than just getting in there and putting some cement so that the vertebra doesn't compress any further than it already has. There are many devices have come into the market and some did not survive the test of time uh, and kind of went away. But definitely there are many devices that are still on the market. I think the, the biggest one of them now at present is this uh, uh, spine jack that is consistently being used to restore the height uh, in the vertebral bodies. This is an Ossifix device uh, that we use, like literally like almost vertebral stents that we put in here. You can see that inflating the stent underneath the superior end plate and then putting cement uh, in, in that uh, stent. It's not available in the market now. OptiMesh was another one that we used. Uh, the cement used to come out uh, from the mesh itself and uh, really is not used in practice. Kiva device is, is, is still in practice. It's still available and we still use it. The good thing about Kiva is that you put these, uh, the introducer wire in and then you thread this peak uh, over the wire and when you have that in the vertebral body, the cement actually only comes out from the inside of this peak rather than coming from the outside. So all the cement is contained within this uh, peak and this can be used for patients uh, with pathological fractures and completely broken vertebral bodies. So here you can see that uh, uh, a keyword device has been used very nicely uh, and after we put the cement, a good fill is considered to be end plate to end plate and from the inside of the pedicle from one side to the inside of the pedicle to the other side. And you can see very nicely the cement is in place there with the use of the Kiva device. Uh, this is a, a patient with a severe pain, a visual analog brain score of 10 on 10. And just few steps you want to be again very close to the superior end plate because the device is go, going to open in a caudal fashion. So you have to give yourself room and the device room to open caudally. And that's what we are doing now. The, the, the wires are, inducer wires have been put in. So this is the wire all the way in. And then we put the, the peak uh, or the sheet over the wire, uh, make sure that it is sitting snugly uh, on both AP and lateral views, and then you put cement in, and this is the post CT uh, in that patient. Uh, uh, spine jack or the implant kyphoplasty is being done uh, now to consistently being used in patients to uh, restore vertebral body height. Of course, as I said, pain palliation is 
number one goal in the in such patients. But uh, this device is used to restore height. Uh, and, and you can see with these videos, uh, when we put them in, how nicely you can elevate the fractured end plates and restore the height of the vertebra. And in some cases, we have almost restored it back to pre-fracture uh, heights, uh, and, and the patient has had really good relief. So this is, these are just a few examples. This is a fracture right here. This is the jack that has been put in place and completely inflated in the vertebra. And this is the post picture. So if you compare the pre and the post, there has been significant uh, height gain. Uh, this is a patient 88 year old with osteoporosis. Uh, MRI was done here. Really, you can't even see where the fracture is, but this was actually a T12 fracture. Uh, CT shows it a little better than the MRI here. You can see a little bit of a retropulsion of the posterior cortex. Patient was managed conservatively, uh, but uh, oh, after a week, you could see an ongoing uh, compression and the patient was complaining of significant pain, uh, which had improved a little bit compared to, to a week ago. So patient was again put in a, in a, in a uh, corset and uh, uh, with, with narcotic analgesia and was sent home. Uh, the brace and the narcotics for three weeks, patient's pain did not get any better, but the patient was now almost completely immobile, was living and sleeping in his uh, recliner. And this is uh, two weeks after you can see where the fracture was barely seen. Now you can see at least a moderate compression fracture. So at that point, patient was sent over to me. And this is when I put the patient on the table. So it's almost a planar now uh, by the time patient was on my table. Uh, so I usually like in, the, in a case such as this, we want to restore some height for this word. So I decided to put in this implant. Uh, so this is just the steps of putting the implant in. And you can see the implants are going in and now we are inflating the implants. Uh, in the patient, and this is the pre-image uh, uh, of the patient, and this is the post-image, so almost, almost double, triple the height of the, the vertebra that was compressed, and the patient had complete pain relief within 48 hours uh, and was uh, very happy uh, with the results. So typically, as I said, for me, if there's a moderate to severe compression fracture, I will use these implants because the aim is A, pain palliation, and B, to restore as much height of that those compressed vertebras as, uh, as, as much as we can. Uh, another example, osteoporotic fracture, 10 on 10 pain. They were not that bad. Uh, we decided to go because these are junctional level fractures, T12, L1 fractures. We went in with uh, spine jacks. And you can see right there, so this is the pre-picture and this is the post-picture. You can see almost normal normal height restoration, pre-fracture level uh, at, at both the levels. And the patient did very, very well uh, with his pain and with a vast score of zero. So I've, I've talked a lot about uh, uh, height restoration. Why? It's not only that we want the images that we do post-procedural to look pretty with good height restoration and everybody say, oh, you give so much of height to the patient and blah, blah, blah. It definitely has a basis to this. And, and the basis to that is when we talk about vertebral fractures, we really talk and concentrate only on the bone. We forget a very, very important other factor or constituent of the spine that is the disc. Uh, and, and, and research has shown us that you need normal vertebral height to maintain your normal intradiscal pressure. And as long as your intradiscal pressure and your vertebral body height is normal, you transfer your axial load from one vertebra into the other vertebra across the disc at the level of the nucleus. Nucleus is really spongy. That's the job of the nucleus that it transmits the weight very easily to the next level. So when you fracture, so, so, so that's, that's your blue line with a normal fracture. 
When you fracture a vertebra, that has an indirect bearing on the intradiscal pressure. And, and we know that the intradiscal pressure falls a lot when you develop vertebral compression fractures. And that's the intradiscal pressure once the vertebra fractured. So what happens with this is that once you do that, the fulcrum of the axial load transforms from the middle of the vertebra to the, from the nucleus into the annulus. And the annulus is not made to transmit that axial load from one vertebra into the other vertebra. And that's what predisposes the adjacent vertebral level for fracture. A lot of people will, will, will say that, hey, by putting cement in one vertebra, are we not putting the other adjacent vertebra at risk? Absolutely. There's no denying that fact that post-cementation you have, uh, you can develop uh, adjacent level fractures. But there's no denying the fact also that if you don't do anything, your adjacent vertebra is also at risk for developing fracture just because of this factor that I told you that the fulcrum moves from the middle column to the anterior column from the nucleus to the annulus fibrosis. And, and the predisposition of anterior level fracture based on this is higher than the predisposition after cement injection. And, and, and the third uh, line, the yellow line that you're seeing is that after the height has been restored, the intradiscal pressure really comes up. It doesn't go all the way to normal, but it's still much, much better than when the fracture had happened with the intradiscal pressure plummeting almost to zero baseline here. So that's that's the whole evidence behind and, 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 and the, 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 the thought process behind height restoration in these, in these fractured vertebrates. Uh, so we actually did a study uh, on spine jack uh, and compared it uh, uh, to the safety profile and everything, pain palliation, adjacent level fractures, and it was published in 21. And, and we found that spine jack definitely did much better than the other uh, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty in regards to pain palliation and in regards to development of adjacent level fractures. Uh, vertebral body stents uh, are also there, and this is this is a prime example of that. Here you can see again the stents have been put in. You inflate the stents very nicely in the vertebra, and then you put the cement uh, in those stents. Uh, which is uh, the thing why we do this. Say for example, comparing this stent to balloon kyphoplasty, you would say that it's it's no different from balloon kyphoplasty. You showed balloon kyphoplasty, and it was very similar. But remember, when we do the balloon kyphoplasty, you inflate the balloons, you kind of push the superior end plate up, but then you have to deflate the balloons to get the balloons out. And when you deflate the balloon, so any good bit of height restoration that you had obtained by inflating those balloon, the, the end plates really come back to rest at their original height. And then you put the cement in and you do get elevation of the end plate, depending upon how much cement you're able to put in, but it's not as consistent as you see with these implant kyphoplasties because the implants are used to attain the height restoration and they are kept in place there. And then the cement is put within these implants. And so the height restoration definitely is much better and because it's uh, better sustained by the implants rather than getting the height restoration with the cement. That is the concept of balloon kyphoplasty. Uh, now, new, new uh, devices are coming in the market in which you can stabilize the vertebral body by putting cement in, and then you have these peak implants and almost like pedicle screws uh, that you can keep in place so that you augment both the the anterior column as well as augment the posterior column. Uh, and one such uh, is, is this V-strut uh, that, that we are using now. And in a normal spine, 60% of the axial load is the anterior column and 40% is by the posterior column. In older age group, the more pressure is, is, is along the anterior vertebral body, hence 
uh, increased incidence of fracturing the, the, the vertebral body rather than the posterior element. So with the, the idea is that with the use of res, uh, these uh, struts, you can, you can pretty much balance it out back to the normal spine uh, of the younger days uh, in, in, in such patients. And I've, we've started to use this more in patients with pathological fractures where the pedicles are involved so that you have some uh, element of uh, structural stability uh, within that uh, involved pedicle. Uh, and this is just an example of uh, we strut here. You can see augmentation of the vertebral body and then uh, these dots that you're seeing, this is the, the struts that have been left in place uh, in the posterior column right here. Uh, so what are the future directions? Where are we heading now? So now a lot of research is being done because we have been using PMMS cement for like decades and decades. Nothing has changed really much in regards to what type of cement we use uh, from our PMMS cement. But now a lot of research is being done in which we are thinking of impregnating our cement with antimitotic agents, uh, these titanium microspheres, bisphosphonates locally for treatment of pathological fractures. So a lot is being done uh, in this realm now, and hopefully one day we will have these drug eluding uh, cement that we will use rather than our, our uh, simple PMMA cement. Uh, bone cement with radioisotopes is being thought about uh, also um, and, and research uh, that can be used, especially in uh, certain cancers. Uh, uh, there are certain chemotherapeutic agents that can be used with bone cement because few studies have shown that bone cement actually eludes out from the cement for about three weeks. Uh, so there are certain chemotherapeutic agents that make a radio resistant tumor more radio sensitive. So we are, we're, we're thinking about uh, mixing those with our cement and hopefully, hopefully uh, so that SBRT or other uh, radiation uh, uh, use can be much better in patients with radio resistant tumors also. Uh, this is also being researched now. There are companies that have come up uh, who are more thinking in terms of osteointegration of the bone cement and, and putting in bone grafts uh, in that, uh, that integrate into the osteostructures and help uh, in, in healing of the vertebral body. And this is one such case where you can see this Schmorl's node, fractured vertebra patient was having pain. And this is the, after these uh, uh, beads were put in, this is 12 months later, uh, you're seeing this uh, osteopearl 100% allograft bone implant that was put in. And you can see nice osteointegration at about 12 months uh, of the bone with these beads. So that's, that's hopefully the future uh, in this uh, area. Uh, as I said, titanium microspheres have been put in. Uh, they've been also in, in, the, in the research world and uh, still being researched, but that's something hopefully we'll get to see uh, in future with our uh, augmentations. And with that, I think we are, we have five, seven minutes for any question answers. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Dr. Khan, you can go ahead and open up that Q&A box. Okay. There's a couple in there for you. Okay, so the first question is, how can we differentiate between pathologic fracture and osteoporotic fracture in an old lady? Uh, so sometimes it can be hard uh, on your routine anatomic imaging. Uh, we know that on uh, routine anatomic imaging, uh, be it CT or be it MRI, uh, we have certain characteristics of pathologic fracture, convex bulging of the posterior uh, cortex is something that goes with uh, uh, malignant uh, pathologic fracture. If you have involvement of the pedicles, uh, that on, especially on MRI, if you have signal changes that go into the pedicles bilaterally, that is something that favors pathologic fractures. 
Uh, if you have a paraspinal mass, uh, be it in the ventral epidural space or the enterolateral aspect of the vertebral bodies, all of those favor uh, pathological compression fractures. But having said that, at times it is extremely hard to differentiate. If you don't have these features and you just have a mild, moderate compression fracture, it is very hard on routine anatomical imaging. Uh, but if we do have some suspicion of patient has remote history of cancer or something like that, uh, here uh, at our practice, we have incorporated uh, advanced uh, spinal imaging where we do diffusion and perfusion imaging now. And that really helps us uh, better understand uh, what anatomical imaging really does not. So that's something that should be incorporated uh, in, 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 in clinical practice now, especially at, in academic centers. I think, I think that's something that needs to be done. Uh, if you're not able to do that, then the only way to answer that question is by doing a biopsy. And most of the time, uh, I do send a biopsy if I'm treating a new fracture. And there is some history of uh, remote history of cancer, or if the history is not clear cut, we always send up uh, the biopsy. Uh, the next one is what shall be done to reduce occurrence of osteoporosis or osteopenia before happening? Very, very good question. And that's why if you are an interventionalist and you are, if you're wanting to become a spine interventionalist, uh, the days of treating a patient and then shoving the patient back to their referrals uh, is, is long gone. Uh, so you have to have your own clinic where you see these patients. And so when I assess these patients, we have a discussion with these patients about osteoporosis. And uh, if they have their PCP or they are have an endocrinologist or a rheumatologist who can take care of their osteoporosis, I've had multiple occasions where the patient never even had a DEXA scan done. So we make sure that we... Uh, tell the patient to get a DEXA scan, and then uh, based on the results and all, we make a referral to either an endocrinologist or a rheumatologist or, or uh, uh, talk to their uh, PCP so that these patients are started on uh, uh, bone strengthening agents for treatment of their osteoporosis. Otherwise, you'll be just uh, chasing one fracture to the next fracture, as I showed in the, the in that timeline on, on one of my patients who roll up like five fractures in uh, six, seven years. So yeah, look at these patients, treat these patients in your clinic, refer them to the appropriate uh, physicians who can take care of uh, osteoporosis. Is the spine jack MRI compatible? If so, at what time interval? So uh, the company will uh, says that it is uh, it is conditional approval of spine jack, uh, but we have done MRI for this study that I showed. I, I pretty much did MRI within 24 to 48 hours after putting the jacks in. So they are completely uh, MR compatible, and you can uh, you can image them right away after placement if need be. There shouldn't be a problem with that, but but they come up with this disclaimer that they are uh, conditional. Uh, what is your comment about using plates to fix a vertebral fracture? Using plates, I quite don't understand uh, plates. Is uh, is are you talking about the ACDF or because? Typically, uh, if it's a surgical uh, fracture, they, they, they put in transpedical screws or they do laminectomies. Uh, if, you, if you can elaborate more on what you mean by surgical plates, uh, I can probably answer that question much uh, better. Uh, why does vertebral augmentation increase the risk of adjacent level fracture? Great question. Again, uh, one of the reasons is because, as I said, uh, we till now pretty much we have been putting in PMMA, and the PMMA has a very high tensile resistant. Uh, it is much much stronger than the inherent bone, especially if you are doing uh, an osteoporotic weak bone. Uh, so that's that's when because of the difference in the tensile strength of the bone, 
uh, in a in a severely osteoporotic patient uh, that that may put the adjacent level at uh, at risk. Sometimes you may have cases where there has been extraposition of cement into the disc space, and that's when I tell my fellows that you have to be very careful not extraposating contrast into the disc space because if the contrast goes into the disc space touches the inferior end plate or the superior end plate of the adjacent vertebra, obviously those, those vertebras will be at, uh, at a higher risk for fracture uh, than the normal uh, bone. <clears throat> what is the treatment policy in US regarding extensive osteoporosis in female symptomatic only at one level? How do you how do you follow up in view of stress on the adjacent uh, vertebra? Uh, so as, as I said, uh, we usually refer our patients either to uh, endocrinologists or rheumatologists who can take care of, but most of the time uh, patients will, will get uh, uh, the bone uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, now you can get monthly, six monthly, and you can get yearly injections. Uh, we tend to follow these patients with a DEXA scan and see overall improvement over time uh, with these scans. But most of the time, of course, you have you have you're taking your vitamin Ds, your calciums, but in severe osteoporosis, you you end up uh, taking uh, these bone strengthening agents, so to say, uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, uh, so so, and 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 then being managed either six monthly or on a, on a yearly basis now. Uh, can these procedures be used to correct a scoliosis? Uh, no, uh, scoliosis uh, definitely needs to be created. I mean, treated surgically, especially if it's a moderate to severe. You need to put rods and screws. Uh, osteotomies need need to be done. Uh, so this is this is that's not an indication for doing uh, vertebral augmentation. I guess that's it. I think that's it. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for your lecture today. And thanks to everybody for participating in Noon Conference. You can access the recording of today's conference and all of our previous Noon Conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Be sure to join us next Thursday, January 12th at 12 p.m. Eastern for a special Noon Conference co-sponsored by the American Association for Women in Radiology for a lecture entitled, The Fountain of Youth Pediatric GU Ultrasound. This lecture will be given by Dr. Barbara Pauly, past president of the AAWR and associate professor of the ER and pediatric radiology at University of Kentucky. You can register for this lecture at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.